Hello, it's Jack Tudor here of Attention Magazine. Welcome to Crucial Listening, the podcast where I speak with musicians and sound artists about three albums that are important to them. My guest this time is Mickey Yui, a composer, artist, musician, originally from Tokyo, based in Dusseldorf since 1994. Mickey's work takes on many forms, mixed media installation, workshops, collaborative projects, many more besides, but also records. And we start this discussion talking about As If, which is her new album on Hallow Ground and Collate's work for Modular. I love Mickey's work for Modular. There's a sense that despite the uh, grandiosity of the machines themselves, Mickey subdues her own input or de-emphasizes it and draws attention instead to the act of listening. She kind of adopts a position of observing the unfolding of events rather than having a impression upon what's happening. So there's a sense of equivalence between her and the listener in that sense. And this seems to be something I kind of observe throughout a lot of Mickey's work, this emphasis on the whole, the kind of lack of specifics that might collapse the possibilities of listening and experience into one form. She leaves everything wide open. So I loved asking her questions about this record because she was able to go in all kinds of different directions and you're here. When I attempt to collapse it into something specific, she broadens it out again in a really beautiful way. So I love this record. Uh, I think you will too. So please do check it out. And if you're enjoying the podcast as well, I think you'll really enjoy this discussion. Then you can support it over at Coffee ko-fi.com forward slash crucial listening you can donate monthly one off any amount you please thank you very much or rate and review or just listen do what you like (laughs) it's your life all right thank you very much uh this is mickey yui on crucial listening Mickey, welcome to Crucial Listening. Thank you for having me, Jack. Thank you for coming on. So you're here to talk about three important albums. Before we get to those, I want to talk about your own new album, As If, which is coming out, or will be out when this podcast goes out, on Hallow Ground. So I've seen you talk about your 2018 trip to the Amazonian rainforest in Manaus, Brazil and how important that was and how it's changed your perception of the environment. And I know you've talked about this a a fair bit, but I wondered if we could start by you just giving me an introduction to that experience and also how it changed your perception of your environment. Well, yes, um, I have been following um, the news as everybody does and listening to the a disaster about deforestation all over the world and also especially about Amazonian forest in Brazil, in Latin America. And um, I was very concerned, but on the other hand, or at the same time, for me, it was very difficult to really feel this disaster mm. and um, all the disasters um, happening in the world seems to me that it is becoming just an, another information and um, I was feeling um, well I had this quest in my 
in myself uh, or my thoughts that I need to be there to understand what it, what is going on. Mm. And uh, through a friend of mine, I was recommended about uh, uh, artists in residence in Manaus, and which is very special residency um, to uh, have an exchange between scientists and artists for ten days. Uh, this artist in residence is aiming at pure research uh, um, residency, and we are we have learned a lot from scientists. And uh, just to feel what the reality is in the Amazonian rainforest, so um, I decided to go there, and I was accepted. And um, in 2018, in in the summer, I was there. For 10 days together with other about 20 artists of different disciplines, um, we were learning uh, about trees, about insects, about the ecology of the forest, and it was very, very intense uh, experience. And also um, the most exciting experience I had there was I felt like coming back home because of the sounds that I heard and I felt in the Amazonian forest, it was pretty much close to what I have been doing uh, in my musical work or the um, structures and the how the sound lives and communicates within each other. Uh, was amazingly similar to what I have been always searching in my music. Mm. So I felt very, though I was never in Brazil before, I felt really, really at home in the forest. I noticed actually it's written on one of the texts I read that this was your first trip. So am I to infer that you've been back? And if so, what was it like returning to the rainforest. I have to admit, I ha- I haven't been back in the rainforest. I ah. have been back to Brazil to present the work uh, after this residency, but um, I haven't yet um, returned in the rainforest. Ah, okay, fair enough. Um, one thing I did like reading about your trip there is how it was difficult to sleep because you know you you wanted to hear how the sounds change as kind of day moves into Mm. night so how did it change i mean did it become i don't know louder quieter or how pronounced or how you know how dramatic was the change as day went into night when you were there well um it maybe it's not about the dramatic change it's a a constant transformation or transition of Mm. sounds because uh, um, in the rainforest uh, it's uh, the species that that they live in the forest are so many and uh, they are um, constantly active I don't know why but they are so active (laughs) and uh, uh, each change like light changes or sometimes as um, rain comes sometimes uh, or it getting dark in the morning getting light all these subtle changes affect all the other um, species Mm. so you really feel this intertwined system of ecology directly Mm. happening so it's it can be also dramatic change, but uh, it's just the um, very impressive thing about is that you really hear this transition and transformation of the acoustic environment. Fantastic. I want to ask about your modular setup as well, because uh, it sounds like from when I've seen you talk about modular, there's, I mean, I think this is true of, most if not all people working with modular synthesizers that there's an aspect of the setup that eludes them and you know that brings with it its element of chance and unknowing but what 
does your modular setup look like at the moment? I mean, is it something that changes often? Are you adding, removing, or, or does it tend to remain quite static? Uh, well, maybe I start from this, that I have not so much idea of how uh, modular working. So, um, or in general, my approach to music is very intuitive. So I started uh, using modular after a um, very long uh, skepsis I had about modular because it sounds very, very technical. And if you don't understand the system, you can't make any music or, mm. uh, or you, will be, you should be a nerd to um, dig into this. And uh, I'm really not the kind of nerd type. So I was hesitating to touch on this. But mm. then I uh, encountered a sound uh, of a modular at my friend's studio and I was immediately, I felt really connected with this sound, spe specific sound. So I thought maybe why not start just experimenting with it. And uh, it was of course uh, because that I felt this sound which I felt really touched uh, um, was um, close to the sound I heard in Amazon. So there is certain connection or um, things are happening um, without any previous uh, um, experience. Without going to Amazon, I wouldn't have really jumped into um, modular synthesizer. Wow. And still, I don't know <laughs> so much about <laughs> modular synthesizer, <laughs> and uh, it's I'm really not into this technical side of uh, um, electronic music. So um, I uh, sometimes really struggle, but mm. sometimes I'm really happy and thankful that something come out outside of my intention. This is uh, maybe a very um, important part which I would speak later also regarding the albums I chose that uh, I of course as an artist I have an, um, I have aim I have feeling that I want to express but also I really want to emphasize that there are things that we can't think of or we can't intentionally create it's for me it's like a um, collaboration of me as an artist and there is something outside that triggers me or i trigger this something and it becomes a piece of art hmm. yeah so modular is the uh, same way i just try and find out what it comes and of course the sound of amazon the experience taught me a lot and I'm still um, um, digesting these thoughts and uh, trying to work it out as in a musical piece or art piece and um, yeah it still remains under the modular synthesizer system. Beautiful. Um, I was listening to the record again before we started talking and specifically song four there is something that sounds like church bells in the background the way that the bells or sorry the way the tones are folding over each other and readjusting their order and even the kind of texture sounds like church bells so i wondered are there filled recordings on this album are they church bells i'm hearing or is that something coming from the, the modular system? Um, many people ask me about, are there this or that <laughs> in my music? <laughs> and I'm also kind of quizzed because it's very difficult to talk about sound and music. Of course, yeah. if you point out like after three minutes and 15 seconds, you did this, maybe I can figure out. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the um, thing uh, that uh, um, maybe uh, my aim or m uniqueness about m my music is everything is entangled and it's very difficult to um, separate sounds. Yeah. Because I started music 
on this uh, very specific experience that nothing is separated, everything is connected. Mm. And this is still my fascination about sound and also about music composing. And as I said, I work very intuitively, so I mix up field recordings, electronic sounds, layering, and um, using this old layer, recycling. So sometimes it's very difficult to tell how much is a field recording, how much is not. Yeah. On this point, what you ask about song four, I would say there is no church bell. <laughs> because uh, um, if I use church bell, it's qu- quite dominant. Living in Europe, uh, church bell is everywhere. So mm. I'm quite aware if I use church bell, then it's quite obvious that I used um for me, it's quite obvious, but I think I didn't use it in this song. That's amazing. There's something that I I really focused in on it, and the way that it moves was, you know, where they start to fall out of time with each other. It's just got mm. the, the exact kind of cascading quality. That's so mm. fascinating. Oh, beautiful. Well, that's <laughs> like, for me, it's like a big success if somebody's telling me about what they heard. Mm. And it was positive experience or reminded them of good memories about sound. And there is no such sound in my music. Then I think, oh, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, well, Mickey, the record is really wonderful. Uh, like oh, I say, thank you. it's coming out on Hallow Ground. I'll put a link in the show notes so that people can check that out and... I definitely encourage them to do so. So let's talk about your three important records. But before we get to any records specifically, uh, I wanted to ask about how you thought about the word important when picking your list of records. So was there a way you understood the word important in order to come up with the list of records that you did? Well, important, I find, I um, understand, first of all, it's important for me. Mm. And uh, for me, it's important if, because I'm an artist and I always look for an experience that through art that transforms my perception, ideas, and uh, um, yeah, I think in this case, I chose these three albums because it has a quality of transformation, transforming mm. our space, our perception of space, and uh, yeah, maybe awakens a different way of listening in different way of listening music. I would really um, emphasize that this is music because <laughs> the <laughs> albums I chose are um, maybe for many people um, very questionable, is it really music or not? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I am a strong believer of uh, music or the force of music that can really change our, our understanding of music. It sounds a bit uh, of Zen, but uh, um, music has much more than um, just melodies and rhythms and relics and uh, um, emotion triggering uh, um, a medium. It has really, it changes completely the environment mm. which you are in. That interests me a lot. What a great answer. Okay, so. Mickey, let's go to your first important record. So uh, I'll let you give me the name of it. I know we've got a specific order uh, that we can talk about these in. So if if you could give me the name of it and then a brief introduction as well as to why this record is important to you. Yes. So I will be talking about Rolf Julius' album, Music for a Distance. Um, Mm. It's on CD and... um, I chose this album because I have worked with Rolf. I was a um, friend of Rolf, or I call it Julius. I called him always Julius. 
And um, yeah, it was very, very special meeting with him. And I still appreciate his music. And sadly, he's not on the earth anymore. But uh, um, he's very, very close friend and yeah, respected artist and um, yeah, very inspiring artist and person. Well, we met. Um, we met through my first album called Small Sounds, in which I released in 1999. At that time, I was living in Cologne, and um, as I released this uh, album, which was on CD, a curator told me that there is an artist called Rolf Julius in Berlin who creates small music. Hmm. And uh, why don't you meet him? or contact him. And I was thinking, ah, interesting. And I was still uh, studying in Cologne. And at that time, it was not much of uh, email and internet. So I wrote him a proper letter and sent him my CD and um, description of my, at that time, uh, uh, project. And he received, but he didn't answer. And ah. but no problem. And then later he had a show exhibition in Cologne, so I went there for the opening, and he saw me. I introduced myself, and he said, "Oh, of course, I remember you. You sent me a letter. It was a very nice album, and I was delighted." And um, he was very, very open and very friendly, and he said, "Yeah, you should come to Berlin." You should um, you should come to Berlin, and I was like, well, um, how can I come to Berlin? I was um, not I didn't have enough money. It was I was struggling um, to sustain my life as an artist, and then I thought, well, um, why don't we make project out of this? So I talked with a radio station, um, WDR in West Germany, um, a radio station, to produce in a radio piece uh, a conversation between Gold Furious and I. So I had kind of budget, and and then I went to Berlin to Gold Furious, and uh, he was kind enough to let me stay at his studio, and we had a few days of conversation which we recorded. And so we kind of, yeah, getting closer and um, we could share so much about sound and music and also some small funny things. We were laughing a lot. And uh, eventually we were invited by um, Singua Gallery in Berlin to play together and in Berlin. And then we realized, wow, we couldn't define which sound is coming from which. It was really <laughs> like a family meeting, and we were constantly laughing. Is this you? No, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it can't be. <laughs> it was uh, so easy, so natural to play with him. It could go for a longer time. And then we played several times, sometimes in at the edge of forest, outside, sometimes in the museum setting. And it was always great pleasure to play with him, like with nobody else. It was so natural. So what um, for those who don't know Rolf Julius, he's uh, uh, one of the um, innovator in sound art, Klangkunst in Germany, it's called. Um, he plays, as his uh, music description tells, small music, which is very small. And uh, um, he plays buzzer, which he uses also for his uh, live performances. And uh, he plays some feedbacks and uh, a lot of field recordings. But also mixture of those creates its own environment. And this is really like what connects us, that we were constantly trying to create kind of very special landscape that is constantly uh, in transformation. Each sounds uh, like living creatures. And um, we were also in the conversation I mentioned before, we really agreed uh, that you can 
put one sound like in a garden and completely transform the environment. Like in a garden, if you plant a plant in a garden, it slowly starts to um, affect the other plants in the garden and changes slowly the environment. And this is exactly what can happen with sound in context of special sound, special music. And we were both uh, composer, but also um, um, installation artist, so to say. I create, and also Rolf has been creating amazing uh, installations. And also for his installation, he uses a lot of pigments that are um, specifically working as in a color. And he said a beautiful sentence. He likes to um, put a sound that makes the space black. Wow. And if it really works or not, but it has some very special quality when you enter in his installations. And uh, um, sometimes the installation is called two times black or why pink, why green or so. It has certain effect that the color can be audible or the sound can be visible. Also, another quality which we share is that we are focusing on this smallness. Because it, this uh, um, sound is small, or the object you put in the space is small, or the, the change in the space is so subtle, uh, the visitor or the person who experienced the work is uh, invited to shift their perception to the smallness. And that has a big effect, actually, to find out another quality in the same space or same object or same sound. I'm so intrigued about this idea of, of smallness. I think particularly in the context of something recorded, say that's on like a CD or a release, like for a mm -hmm. sound to be small. I'm sure you've talked about this a lot, but, you know, with a, a release that you put out into the world where the sounds might be small, you can always crank the volume. Or as mm -hmm. you say, sometimes the object itself is is small. I just think it's, it's wonderful to apply this sense of scale with sounds. There's like so much that goes on in my head when I think about what constitutes large and small sounds. So... Could you tell me a bit about this? Unlike, I think it's unlikely this has a definitive answer, right? But what is it for you that makes a sound like a small sound? Yes. Um, well, I named my first album Small Sounds, and they were really small. In It was on CD, and uh, the volume on the CD was very quiet. Yeah. And uh, I also put um, a small card inside the CD. The CD was, uh, um, by the way, the cover was made of industrial felt. So it had already a sense of quietness. <laughs> so if you buy the CD, uh, it was just uh, um, industry felt, which inside was a CD. And there was a card saying, please play this CD as quiet as possible in your room. And my aim was, because we are living in any circumstances, there is always sound around you. Mm. And if you put the CD, if you put my music on, I was hoping and also aiming that my music um, dissolves in the environment and plays together with whatever in the listener's space. And um, because it emerges from my own experience. As a small child, I was often sick and uh, I couldn't go to school, so I was staying at home in bed. And um, because you have nothing else, you are just kind of listening. Mm. And then I realized, 
often if you are ill, then you are very close to you. You feel very intimate. You're close to your body, so you are listening to your own breathing or the bed clothes, very subtle thing. But same time, I could hear what was going on outside. There were some birds, some pigeons, which I don't like, so I tried to erase them in my head, and it didn't work. And gradually, I start to get into a space that I realize everything is so interconnected. I couldn't erase the pigeon sound, or I could hear the very close sound of my breathing or my heartbeat. The same as the car passing by, which was pre- pretty loud. <laughs> and this very special feeling, of course, I forgot about this uh, experience, but as I was creating this small sounds album, this experience really came back to me, and I realized, okay, this is what I want to make through my music. That was a very initial point in my music creating. Maybe because I started recording sounds just because of curiosity uh, at the time on very simple cassette player or that player, that I start to listen to the um, environment through field recordings. Then I reached this point that there is always sound and sounds are always connected, and sounds never stay the same. It's always transforming and resonating with each other. And this experience brought me back to my memories in my childhood that came, that maybe crystallized as an album, Small Sounds. Incredible. I also want to talk about this this record as well. Um, this is an incredible album music for a distance uh that you picked here i think what i find most striking about it is that i listened through it once and then at any point afterwards i could really vividly recall the sensation of listening to it it's such a distinctive Mm. piece of work but also it really does evoke this sense of distance and like i say with this ability to you know, you can make the volume really loud if you want, but there's something about the way that Rolf arranges these sounds, which means that the majority of what's going on feels separate from you and feels like it's receding or it does feel like it's at a distance from you. Mm. Uh, There's something about the perspective that he's doing, which is really striking. So what's your experience like with this? album and why did this record specifically in amongst Rolf's works emerge as the important album for you? Well um, it's interesting that you say that you feel this distance very vividly through this album. I agree and at the same time I feel as if this music comes inside myself. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not about distance for me. It's about observation, maybe. That um, something is happening and you are the one who is observing. So I have the feeling that Rolf Julius, of course, created, composed, but he, even himself as a composer, is kind of an you know, observer of his own music. Uh, this is just my um, very personal um, um, perception about this album. I think everybody um, has own feeling about this album. It's anyway very, very beautiful, so I can recommend anyone just if if there is a chance to listen to it. It's like diving into a special environment. Mm. And... Yeah, for me, it's uh, um, maybe the distance uh, um, I translate into observation. Yeah. Is it an album that you still listen to now? Well, because also Rolf is a very important uh, person for me. Um, I listen time to time again and again. Not Mm. only this album, but this album is uh, especially very close to me. 
And Miki, is there any other things you wanted to say about this album before we move on to your second record? Well, maybe one thing that uh, I um, I think it also I I can carry on uh, this uh, um, my interest in composer as an observer is mm-hmm. uh, that uh, um, Rolf was incredible also not only in music composing how to place sounds but uh, he was uh, incredible in his sound installation I was uh, together with him when he was setting up uh, his installations uh, um, I observed how he just changes the position of the speaker of the object maybe just 10 centimeter or it's not about the centimeters but he just plays a little bit differently and whole space can change and you have the feeling uh, that this is right and this is how it should be Hmm. it's not about the artist aiming at um, this looks good or this is like my what I want to say but he always tried to find just right position for this object or for this sound I mean that does actually intersect with a question I was planning to ask at some point in this discussion which is about when you're making your music it feels to me I don't know if this is true, but this is what I get from listening to it, the sense that there's not a lot of manual intervention. I don't feel like I'm hearing hands adjusting dials to instigate change. It feels like, to me, that you're almost contributing to the setup of lots of variables that are then interacting with each other but what's your relationship like with that when you're making your music you talked about this con- composer observer distinction how do you relate to this idea of intervention are you someone who while the pieces are happening and you're recording are touching the modular synthesizer a lot do you let things happen do you have to stop yourself from intervening or yeah i don't know whether there's a coherent question in there but hopefully you get what i'm driving at yes 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 absolutely um, um you kind of hit the point <laughs> where <laughs> i i am struggling and um yeah enjoying in my own studio that uh, um i try to intervene in music as much as necessary yeah and this necessity comes out through what the sound or the um, the piece of, I call it, living thing tells me what to do. <laughs> and sometimes I understand that it should be like this and I transform or modulate a lot. But uh, through the um, over 20 years of career, I tend to just accept and see that maybe there sometimes no change necessary or um, just adding some small things is enough or so. So I'm, I think my intervention is getting less and less and my uh, part is more to find out the right, like in the... Um, sense of space the right, right position mm. or right duration because things are always changing to find the point where it ends I think the biggest work of artists is how to end mm. how to end yeah yes starting is for me easier <laughs> but how to end defines the piece yeah I see I think about this a lot with making music where it almost feels um, sometimes you need to make a concession to the medium because the music has to stop to fit on a disc but Mm -hmm. do you ever does it ever feel to you like it's 
contrived that you have to end a piece i i certainly have the experience where i'm with some pieces i'm like well if if it was an option this just would carry on and i would walk out the room while it was still playing Mm. you know yeah i understand what you mean um uh, I have uh, opportunity to create installation, which is course, never ending. Yeah. So this would be maybe another possibility. But uh, mostly in music creating, if I aim at certain album or there is certain time limitation, or let's put it in other way around, that I feel it in my fingers that this music ends here. <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, if you have one hour or so, then you have to find out that maybe what this music tells to go where to find another music. Or maybe there is already another piece of music that uh, corresponds with this uh, music, previous music. And I'm always looking for something that starts conversation and kind of triggers imagination to go forward because we are always going on everything is everything goes on so um, I'm still thinking I'm always thinking by creating what could be the conversation how the conversation can go on Mickey, let's go to your second important album now. So, again, yes. if you could give me the name of it and then a, a little introduction as to why this one is important to you. Okay. The, my second album is Elian Radik, Vice Versa, mm. etc., from 1970. And uh, I guess Elian Radik, for your listener of the podcast, is... Uh, pretty known mm-hmm. um, she's uh, another extraordinary artist composer my interest in her music is mostly in her very early years and this album is even before she um, started to use the uh, modular synthesizer this is a purely feedback piece on tape which is cons- uh, cons- uh, which is um, this piece is made for an uh, installation, and because installation was uh, I think quadrophone, uh, multi multi track installation, multi speaker installation, so um, the CD is split into one signal, next signal, and uh, all signals together. It's pretty strange album to listen to <laughs> the different channels and then all the channels together. And uh, um, it sounds, one could say, maybe a bit like something out of scientific laboratory. Uh, what I really like about uh, this album is that, uh, again, this observation and, of course, that it is made out of feedback. Because um, as I was just starting uh, working with sound, in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, I was also fascinated about feedback. Feedback has something uh, which is so fascinating and also has very wild uh, um, intervention in space. Mm. Um, mostly before I knew a feedback of guitar feedback in rock and roll music or something. But if you just take microphone and speaker and do very, very simple feedback um, experience, it has almost feels like magnetic. There is something about... Um, 
feedback that really uh, triggers you in physical and also psychological way. And this piece of uh, Elian Radik is very, very minimal, and it's constantly shifting and transforming that sometimes I even forget that this is music going on. <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> uh, again, coming back to my love for a certain kind of experience, acoustic experience, is that, that I realize that sometimes my refrigerator or some fans or some, some street noise outside becomes part of the music. Yes. Which I'm listening to. Not necessarily only my music, but in this uh, Elian Radik case, it happens a lot. I think because that's often used as a derogatory thing with music like this, where someone might say, oh, it just sounds like my fridge. And yes. It's nice to invert that and be like, well, isn't that wonderful? that mm. you can attune to your fridge or air conditioning mm. uh, with the same level of attentiveness as you might apply to uh, something that's styled explicitly as music, right? Mm. Mm. Yes, <laughs> and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. Uh, so with vice versa, etc., do you remember how you first discovered this album? Well, um, I think for also many artists, uh, listeners, uh, many audience, um, Elian Radik uh, um, emerged out of um, blue, not blue, but she was always there, but uh, she became more known uh, in recent years. Hmm. And um, also many uh, reissues come out. And I heard about Elian, and at the quite same time, I met a um, few musicians who worked with them. So my interest was uh, to listen to her music, and through listening to different music, I encountered this album. I am lucky enough to have this CD through um, my partner who buys regularly um, interesting records and he just brought me and said, you are interested in Elian Radik and I saw the CD, would you like to listen to it? And yeah, it was, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, maybe. The CD comes with a recommendation basically to experiment with forms of playback and yes, I I love this because you know, in a way, the listener is just as active in the composition process as Eliane is in terms of setting the variables that determine the sound. So, uh, mostly when I listen to this, I actually just play it through as one linear thing, which is mm -hmm. uh, I I think even described in the in the album notes as being the lazy way to do it <laughs> but <laughs> 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 which oh, yeah. uh, is fine by me uh have you experimented much with the different combinations and ways that you can listen to this album um i didn't realize this word laziness but uh <laughs> <laughs> nor did i <laughs> Well, um, I was aware that this is uh, possible to play in a multi-channel setting, um, which I might have done, but I haven't yet. Mm -hmm. And somehow, for me, it's more, um, this album is a bit of uh, her um, science laboratory, and I didn't... Maybe if uh, Eliane Radik presents this work as an uh, installation, then I would love to go there to find out how it yeah. feels. But I didn't really think to experiment myself, though I find I agree with you, it's wonderful to give audience, uh, listeners, a chance to experience and explore by themselves. Because through exploring, you find yeah, very special um, experience. You gained experience of exploration. 
And this is also, I think, really very important part of Elian Radik, which I think uh, um, is also important in my work. That's why I really resonate with her work, because she talks a lot about path, explore, exploring, and I really love that she still works uh, with musicians in the oral tradition way, that she um, doesn't fix music in a very strict composer way, that the music is always in... Or well, music has its room, space for transforming itself, and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Have you seen her music performed or presented in a live context before? Yes, yes, several times. Not many, but uh, several times. Yes, it's oh, mesmerizing. Yeah, I'm presume was that the um, material for acoustic instruments. Um, yes, as well, and I also experienced her um, electronic piece uh, played back in uh, um, a Swiss mountain outside. So <laughs> it was also very, very special experience wow. to just dive into. Yeah, for me, it's like she's guiding or her music is guiding us and not giving us a goal. But this process becomes the experience of music. Mm. And this I really love. And especially, I also love these instrumental pieces, but uh, um, I love electronic pieces because there is no no, um, instrument to look at. (laughs) <laughs> that, yes, that's true. <laughs> that sometimes you think you start to think something else. You look at instruments, you see how the musicians play, which are, is absolutely wonderful. But these electronic pieces, they are so present without being too much visually attracting. Yes, absolutely. Speci- yeah. So something happens in my brain because I'm not too busy with looking at instruments. Yes. So I saw the piece, uh, I don't know if this is the right pronunciation, Lil Resonant, Mm -hmm. played back in a church where, Mm. because it was just playback, we were all sat on uh, benches that all just faced each other and there was nothing Mm. in the middle, which was funny because it kind of made for a social energy in that you Mm. were if you opened your eyes you were looking at other people listening which felt Mm. kind of strange and a bit intimate as well Mm. um but yeah i agree the 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 kind of lack of a central thing like a sound source to focus on i think for me made me aware of where my attention could go rather than Mm. the point of instigating the sound it's like actually what about these frequencies over here or or this over here your listening is my listening's more dispersed because Mm. of that i think Mm. yeah i totally agree it's interesting because this music is uh, um, or maybe all the music I chose for this show uh, has something really extreme uh, that you can really just experience. It's mm. even beyond listening in the sense that we normally understand we listen through ears or we experience concert, there is musician and there is audience, there is stage and there is um, um the audience sitting in the seat, looking at them, there is something beyond this that if as if you dive into a ocean, and that is also uh, something that Erian Radik also refers to um, her music, that um, you dive into this uh, um, yeah ocean of sound and music, that uh, there is no. You can't just look at certain thing and understand this is the sound source or so. Yeah. You're just in the middle of it. Yeah. Uh, Mickey, is there any 
last things you wanted to say about this album or Eliane before you move to your final record? Mm, I think I've said everything about this album. I mean, it's uh, never ending, so <laughs> I have to find, <laughs> I have to set as end. <laughs> So, your final important album. Again, Mickey, if you could give me the name of it and then a bit about why it's important to you as well. Yes, my third album is Musique Vert. Um, I'm, my French pronunciation is not so good, so I hope I said it correctly, by Jean-Yves Bosseur, mm -hmm. a French composer. Um, well, I explain maybe I start explaining what is music wert is that uh, it's an old tradition which maybe we all know uh, no matter which culture you're from that we build instruments from some grass some wood sticks something you find some organic materials you find in a garden in a park everywhere and you create kind of flute or you create some kind of percussion, percussive instrument out of this green stuff. And it's called Musique Wert in, uh, in Fr France. And there was a research about this tradition, folk tradition, in 60s. And this uh, was made as a book and also as a project that elderly person who knows about these uh, instruments giving uh, a lecture or teaching younger generation how to build this and how to play this. And from this project, the French Cultural Ministry invited the composer Jean-Yves Bossier uh, to create a musical project from this project, um, this album was created. And I'm very much interested how this composer um, approached this uh, material because, first of all, it's something so common that we tend to not give um, enough attention to or um, give value to it. And he really thought how to create music from these very simple um, instruments or um, materials. Uh, and he created a uh, text instruction. And that reminds me of how to create collective music, which is uh, very maybe for certain aspect of a composer unusual because you let the music or you give the decision of creating music to others who are working collectively mm. so you let go this yeah how to say authority of a composer yes and at the same time because these instruments are created um, with uh, organic materials, they have no tonality which we know from Western European instruments. On the other hand, they go very well together, no matter in which combination. So the work of the composer was to think how to uh, create uh, music in collectively by um, giving instruction to correspond each other or um, also correspond to the environment. So this um, I find fascinating. This music uh, really becomes an uh, environment inside 
uh, environment. So mm. it's it's uh, like sometimes you think, is it really the playing of the music theater, or is it just frogs or birds or yeah. is it wind? So it becomes really part of the environment which it is played in. And you can't really dis quin distinguish anymore which is which. Absolutely. Uh, it feels really important as well the fact that the players on this record are listed as being amateurs and children. Right. Uh, uh, and also, uh, one text I read said that, you know, this has in places certain sonic likenesses to maybe something that might have come out of the GRM or EMS which mm. almost makes this wonderful horseshoe where you've got these synthesizers and things that children absolutely would not be allowed to touch in the company <laughs> of most adults mm. and then you've got these instruments made from materials and explicitly uh, made with the purpose of being toys and you end up with sonic results that feel like they have a certain kinship to them yeah it's it's nice that you touch on this because I um, looked up about the composer because I didn't know him at all he studied with Stockhausen right. and um, this is also struck me a lot because my love for this n so called natural sound or uh, that I'm interested in field recordings is also not only me but for other composers connect to, connected to this electronic music. Mm. I don't know how much he really refers uh, his work with music Werther to his previous studying with uh, Stockhausen, but I can imagine if you studied with Stockhausen and you have this electronic um, sounds uh, in in your over, then, yeah, I think you have different ears, different approach to this so-called natural sounds. Mm. Sometimes for me, um, natural means not necessarily this... Uh, division of natural or synthetic or natural or artificial natural is what naturally there and since we live in the city the electronic sound a part of our nature yes yeah even in the countryside you always hear some mobile phones and cars and um, it's part of our whole nature so um yeah that's um, interesting that all these sounds, sounds uh, for me like a thing which we have in common. And this connects us to nature or to the city, to urban settings, to memories. So it's uh, only about how to use them, how you perceive them. You mentioned you know, the word us there, because I think so much of your work involves... I mean, this is very pertinent, actually, given the project you've just been involved in, too. Mm -hmm. um, we are more we are more alike than different mm -hmm. with yourself and Stefan Schneider. So I understand that, you know, sound and community was, you know, a, a central theme of that. Um, I mean, tell me a bit about that project. Uh, what how did it come about and, and, and what did it involve? Well, um I and Stefan were invited by Beethoven Foundation in Bonn to research into sound and com community, the, mm. um, how sounds shape the community or how communities shape sounds. And uh, it was um, originally, uh, the idea was since uh, um, this year, 2024, is 75 years of uh, West Germany uh, constitution the anniversary of the constitution right. and so there were many projects regarding democracy and since we are living in the world now which the um, idea of democracy 75 years ago kind of completely changed I would say or questioned 
So um, we said, well, this idea of democracy is maybe too big. We break it down to community. And uh, we went to Ghana because uh, Cape Coast uh, city in Ghana is a partner city of Bonn. It's a university city, but it's also at the coast there are a lot of fishermen community. And through people, um, introducing people, we um, were lucky to meet uh, many different people from different fields, the people from radio station, community radio station, fishermen, um, academics, uh, um, traditional drama, and also female traditional dramas. And we could collect a lot of different stories. We were interviewing, recording sounds, all around sound and community. And many questions emerged from this process. Um, were actually similar to what we always question in our life in Western world, let's say in Europe, about uh, immigration, about uh, digitization, tradition, um, the gap between urban life and the countryside, and demography. And um, it was so exciting to look into these questions and of course, some questions are looking from totally other side, but still we realized we are more alike than we are different. Mm. So um, coming back to Germany to present this project, we said we don't want to present only Ghana, what we did in Ghana, because then it looks like um, you are making, um, I don't know, some video evening about your uh, holiday in Ghana or so. <laughs> right, how, yes. How yeah. different Ghana is. And yes. this was really the opposite of what we wanted. We wanted to show how we are more alike. So we chose certain themes which we encountered in Ghana and translated and invited people from Europe, from different parts of the world, to find out what we have in common, what activity can activate community uh, using sound. So we were talking about sound archive in Ghana, in North Caucasus, which is Russia, and we are talking about decolonization of uh, um, archive in Ghana and also in Russia. And uh, we were talking about storytelling, its role in music, in pop music, in high life music from Ghana. And uh, we were talking about storytelling in the news agency, which is based in uh, Bonn in Germany, Deutsche Welle. And uh, how this storytelling can affect our um, history, for example, independence of Ghana or... Um, yeah, demonstration um, recently in Kenya, affecting, um, again, other countries in Africa. And, um, yeah, again, uh, demonstrations here in Europe. And these, every, all elements have sounds in it. Maybe we are not so much aware, but we share a lot of information, feelings, experience through sounds. very last part of the project was a deep listening workshop and mm. sound walk, which I um, invited um, Viv Coringham, who is a sound artist composer. She worked with Pauline Oliveros, who created the deep listening um, workshops. And um, she gave us uh, um, four hours of deep listening workshop and um, sound walk in Bonn, which was really, really, yeah, touching and yeah. Fantastic. Very important experience I did, yes. That sounds amazing. Um, I mean, the reason I bring it up in the context of this album is this, you know, idea, I guess, of... Uh, you talked about the composer releasing authority and uh, engaging in something that feels a lot more communal. And uh, I guess in that case of the album, more true to the way in which those instruments would have been used which is you know in the context of games uh people being able to uh, behave quite freely 
after just an initial point of instigation i mean you're you're involved in a lot of works that you know engage people in workshops uh you know bringing people in i guess to the experience of working within sound i mean do you have any thoughts as to why that for you has an appeal like bringing you know outside of just recording your own music engaging in things like workshops that bring other people into the experience well thank you jack uh, on touching this uh, this is also a very interesting phase of my um work that um, I thought I'm very much solo artist. Um, I can't, for example, improvise with anyone immediately. I'm more. I prefer more to stay in my own studio and create my own work. And uh, I like solitude. I was mm. thinking that way, but maybe through working with sound uh, because I'm becoming more and more open to what is going on um, acoustically in the environment and also coming to Amazon where this environment really are actively interacting each other intensely. This, this experience maybe shifted a little bit uh, or maybe opened up my ears and my eyes to um, collective being. If you look at um, the um, ecology, the our being as a collective uh, being, not only individuals, individuals exist, in which is individuality is very important. But um, if you look at things like how music work, then you start to understand this. Nothing is really on the individual, it's collective. And there is collective, that's why individuals are also interesting. And what could be uh, the form for collectivity or community? And because I create kind of strange, but I create music, so my interest is to look at community as like piece of music. And um, slowly after Amazon, um, I start to um, combine my work with workshop where I um, encounter people which I would never encounter through my concerts, my exhibitions, because mostly you are on, in your own small bubbles of mm -hmm. art people, music people. And through doing workshop, we could really share um, many different things around the theme of ecology um, with yeah people which I've never could have never met, and it's so inspiring and it's so refreshing f as an artist to look at um, work through different eyes or different experiences. Yeah. So still, still, I am very. I love uh, solitude in studio, but at the same time, I feel it is like a second motor for me. It drives in uh, because me alone driving um, has only maybe one way, but there are many different paths which you could experience and um, this community idea is one of this and also feeding me a lot in my uh, thinking and my feeling about music. I have one more question for you, Mickey, and that's about how you relate to music as someone who buys it 
and you know listens to it in amongst your daily life so firstly do you have any preferred formats for releases or and is there anywhere that's specific that you like to go and purchase music as well well um i prefer physical um medium like vinyls and cds sometimes also cassettes mm. um, because i when i put them on the record player or cd player i'm more conscious to listen to it mm-hmm. and um yeah nowadays you are um so busy with so many different uh, information sources that um, even music becomes just part of information. And of course, I do that um, for research, for just checking a lot of uh, online listening. But then I realize I'm not that really focused listening. And it just passes by. So I prefer always, uh, when I decide to listen something, then I listen to physical, mostly vinyls. And where I buy them, well, um, I must say I'm a bit, I'm not so much a um, vinyl buyer. Um, mm-hmm. It just comes to me through Stefan because he's uh, he has a more good sense of picking up things. And uh, when I go to record store, I'm just overwhelmed and I don't know yeah. what to do. <laughs> so um, I go to record store or even also bookstore, um, mostly when I know something that I want to get. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes in bookstore, I'm lucky to find books because bookstore, you can just, you know, get into books and find out some sentences. But the record store, you have to listen. And then for me, listening is, yeah, it's it's a special thing. So I always uh, let uh, vinyls come to me. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Uh, with with, With you and Stefan, how similar are your inclinations in terms of what you like to listen to or are there some big differences well um maybe he's uh, um very diverse in listening and also very interested listener and i'm more just open listener and mm. uh, as i said i'm very intuitive person so sometimes things are very sounds good to me or not good to me it, it depends on the moment but mostly we share a lot of uh, interest in common that's a good thing about um, because it's not necessarily um, very popular music we listen to we listen also to popular music but we share also love for um, music that are not so common that's great uh, well Miki, that's all my questions. Thank you so much. I mean, hearing about your record has been amazing. And these three records were all very special. And hearing about your connection to them as well was wonderful. So huge thanks. Thank you very much, Chuck. It was very nice talking to you. Excellent. And to everyone listening, I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.